So it's an absolute excitement, pleasure, honour that I introduce you to Kevin Bed. But let me just introduce you first and just let you know what he does. Because he is actually calling him Kevin the Brain Bennett. <laughs> so Kevin is a mental and emotional strategist and he has helped empower over 1.2 million people globally since 2010 via seminars, workshops at university schools, you name it, podcast, TV, he's done it. Okay, so this question is such a huge question, as I said, that only Kevin the Brain Bennett can answer. So without further ado, Kevin, welcome to Only with Iola. Thank you, thank you. And <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you as well for all of your years of support. Um, you supported me over the years and I truly, truly appreciate all that you've done. So I, I guess in that sense, the conversation is that we are all our helplines in one form or another. Okay. Because we all need someone to turn to, and you're one of those people throughout time. Yes. You've always supported uh, the, uh, my journey as well, so, so likewise, thank you very much. Oh, wow. Oh, look at that. I wasn't, wasn't expecting that. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But likewise, you know, Kevin's in there on the phone, um, you know, for many people, including myself, you know, as well as professionally. So... Kevin, let's just start at the beginning because, you know, this month, June, is Men's Mental Health Month. Now, I didn't even know there was such a thing as Men's Mental Health Month. I shouldn't say. I did know there's some, such a thing as Men's Mental Health, but not Men's Mental Health yeah. Month, the awareness of it. And I think it's something that's definitely needed yeah. um, for various reasons, but we'll get into that in a second. But first, I just want to start off with you sharing a bit about your personal story. Um, I know it's, it's a huge story in itself, but just kind of one aspect you can just draw on, talking about your personal journey with mental health, yeah. trauma, and what has helped you. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I talk about it quite a, book, a bit in my book, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I grew up originally in Brixton, Stoker Park Estate, um, 80s, 90s, and that particular time, it, there was so much trauma and I didn't realise that we were all constituents of generational trauma. Mm -hmm. um, different cultures coming together mm -hmm. that were suffering their own journeys of trauma from all around the world, from the Caribbean to African countries to throughout Europe as well. And then when you're kind of when you're all accumulated into one estate, one estate block, um, you don't realise that you're all bringing different things to the pot. So when you're living underneath, on top of and beside traumatised people, um, in you know internal trauma starts mm -hmm. to sometimes progress into external trauma, and so um, and external regression. Mm -hmm. So over time, you know, I've been stabbed four different times in my life. My brother's been murdered, shot and killed. Mm -hmm. I've had a nephew that hung himself. I've had a child oh that gosh. died. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had friends, numerous friends, being sectioned mm -hmm. on the under the Mental Health Act. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it, I've seen so much, and obviously there's been a lot of killings and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so over time, you do tend to accumulate um, so much data on, on trauma, and we've all experienced some form of trauma, e even, you know, developmental trauma between the age of zero to six years old. Yeah. I didn't realise growing up that so many of my friends, it's only with a more of an educated mind as you grow up and you look back, that they were suffering trauma in the house, you know, for some it was physical abuse, for others it was sexual abuse. And so it led me down my path to really understand what trauma is about and, and my mission to help people that are going through trauma mm -hmm. and are suffering in silence fundamentally. Yeah. That's where uh, most people suffer is because they suffer in silence, either culturally, um, sometimes the bureaucracy of governments as well. So I talk about in my book of the fact that Doctors, for example, in certain yeah. countries, they can't express themselves or they can lose their license. Yes. So there are many different reasons why people are suffering in silence, which then morphs into mental health problems, mm -hmm. psychosis, bipolar, uh, manic depression, um, you know, so many different types of depression and, yeah. and disorders, etc. And so it's been my mission, I would say, since 2010 mm -hmm. to help people to really. Uh, get to express themselves mm. and also share what's going on. And what drew you to that? What drew you to that particular? Um, one of the main things is my my, my mother. Um, when she came into England, you know, she, it it was that time of no dogs, no blacks, 
or Irish, etc. Mm-hmm. And um, my, my mum was, was a leading nurse at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, she was also a nurse at Mosley Hospital. Mm-hmm. And so I've seen my mum over the years being supportive and helping people. But parallel to that, who, who was supporting my mum? She brought up six of us, and we were the best of children at the best of times, mm-hmm. you know, with our behaviour. Mm-hmm. And then my sister, um, before she died, she had um, postpartum depression. Mm-hmm. And so my mum adopted four of her children on top of it. So it was that conversation, who's helping my mother when my mother needed help. Yeah. And so I recognised that from a young age. I didn't title it that way, but I did mm-hmm. recognise mm-hmm. um, how much she was really struggling and suffering as well. Mm-hmm. But she came through. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, obviously the, the, the untimely deaths of, of three of my siblings, um, I watch my mother go through that and still remain strong. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we, we, we see strength and we high five strength, but sometimes that strength is a part of survival and sometimes that strength disconnects um, the, the relationship mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, that's where I, I believe it started, is really observing mm-hmm. my surroundings, seeing those two people around me. Yeah. So how did you make that transition? Um, I know that you're somebody very well read, um, is it something that you had to train in, or did you sort of from experiences? What did you draw on to kind of get to where you now have made this book? And this is not just a book. Like I, I'm actually surprised to see that this is so it's such a dense book. Actually, not surprised, pages. but I was I thought I didn't think it was going to be as thick. But it how yeah. how long? Five five hundred pages. Do you know what? Only Kevin the Brain that just <laughs> walks in like yeah, I just written a book, you know, in a year and a half, and you know, and it, I know that's. A momentous achievement to actually Thank write you. a book in yeah. itself. So congratulations! Mm-hmm. But you know, it looks like such a dense book, and I know that you are so well read, so thorough. Um, so I know that you you've read many books over the years, sure. but in terms of your your emotional and mental strategies, how did you kind of start doing that work in terms of um, I, I helping al- people? I, I always advise people. So from a young age, mm-hmm. I've had a minimum twenty five mentors in all different areas, from spirituality, to psychology, to business, Mm -hmm. to lifestyle, etc. And I've traveled, so when I went on my journey of understanding human behavior, Mm -hmm. I traveled to over 25 countries, just studying human behavior. I, I, you know, I've read. Don't do anything by halves, <laughs> not by halves. Yeah. Oh, love yeah. it, love um, it. I, I, I read. Uh, I was ferocious mm. uh, when it comes to you know studying people, mm. um, and I started studying animal behaviour by, by uh, I was inspired by um, a doctor named um, Doctor Pansat. Mm. Um, he discovered um, emotions in rats. And so I started to study um, how rats have emotions, etc., and discovered that rats have similar emotions mm-hmm. to human beings. And so that's where it's got to discover the seven um, uh, brain systems that we have as human beings. Oh, you know, wow. so when we're going through different emotions, there are seven systems that mm-hmm. we're governed by. Mm-hmm. And so that led me down the path when I started to study people like David E. Burns, who wrote one of the first powerful self-help books called Feeling Good. And so I was just reading, 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 mm-hmm. and I started to work with people. Um, I went back into the community. I was working with literally hundreds of people throughout time, you know, just kept on working to to turn into thousands overall. Mm-hmm. And then I, I discovered something that really made me interested in studying human behavior. And what I discovered was that different occupations vibrate in different frequencies. Mm-hmm. And that's when it really captured me. So every single occupation has a vibration frequency. Right, so what is the, I mean, I know that you've got a list here. Um, should we go through the list? Sure. Listeners, listen listen carefully. Also, you guys that are, li- are listening live from the socials. I don't know if you just heard what Kevin said, but this is, this is, quite, this is quite serious um, as it pertains to our occupation. Because if you think about it, we spend most of our lives at our jobs within our, you know, our, our, our fields. And um, yeah, so Kevin's drawn up this list, um, which is included in his book, of the different occupations that um, are highly affected by stress. Um, I believe it is. So we've got stress by occupation. Yeah, so we've got stress by occupation, we've got depression by occupation, we've got suicide by occupation. So mm-hmm. these are these are uh, stats, statistics, etc., that were drawn up by the CDC and the NHS. 
Jesse right. and Avon. Can you tell us a few guys, the people listening? I don't know yeah. if you are in a high stress or high depression occupation. So right. if you want to share it. Sure. So you have high, you have occupations um, that are high stress. So for example, firefighters, mm -hmm. uh, physicians, airline pilots, police officers, um, event managers, uh, taxi drivers, really? uh, construction workers, yeah, massive. Mm -hmm. uh, pharmacists, uh, financial analysis, um, sales managers, uh, mental, mental health um, counselors, etc. Mm -hmm. um, they have, you know, police officers, they have very high, and this is very, very important as well, and I get to why the importance of it, they have very high um, stress rates. Mm -hmm. Then you have occupation with high depression rate, um, and nurses have very high depression rate because of occupation. Um, nursing home workers, social workers, mm. healthcare workers, artists, entertainers, writers, teachers, very high depression rate, um, administrat administrative um, support staff, um, maintenance workers, uh, financial advisors, salespeople, food staff, very, very high depression rate, um, construction workers, childcare workers, then you have occupation by suicide, um, and so these are like, they're more than like to have 10 times the likelihood of suicide than the general public just because of their occupation alone. Right. Um, so surgeons, very high suicide rates, mm -hmm. dentists, uh, police officers, veterinarians, uh, financial services, um, real estate agents, very high suicide rates, um, electricians, lawyers, um, doctors, farmers, farmers extremely, extremely high. It's, now it's, now it's that, one, high. that one threw me a little bit. Yeah, farmers. Yeah, because I'm thinking, okay, from the list that you've read, especially when it comes to the suicide, yeah. it seems to be more so with regards to what I can see the commonality or the pattern is risk, danger, you know, yeah. their, their propensities for that, you know, not propensity, but, you know, exposure yeah. to those things. But farmers? Yeah, let me explain a bit about farmers. So mm. in India alone, 24 farmers per day commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Every single day, 24 farmers commit suicide in India alone. Uh, but all over the world, farmers are committing suicide at a very high rate, and I'll explain some of the reasons why. Some of it is that they, um, they have generational um, expectations, mm -hmm. and so they have to look after a farm so by themselves a lot of the time, so they're isolated mm -hmm. in their own environment, no mm -hmm. one's talked to, and they've got to look after a farm that is generations passed down. Then they've got to deal with pesticides, they've got to deal with climate uh, climate um, change. Mm. Um, so there's time that their crops won't grow. Then, yeah, then they've got to yeah. deal with um, machinery, etc. They've got to deal with late nights and isolation. Mm. They've got to deal with, you know, if their crops don't work, they're finished for the whole for the whole year, the whole season. Um, and then they've got to deal with uh, the, the finances side. They don't actually make much money. Mm. So then what happens on top of it? They start to get um, loan sharks that will come in, and then they will put a lien against their their farms, etc. And yeah. so there's so much pressure that's on them, right. um, suffering in silence, living in silence, and, mm -hmm. and if you really want to be in a dark place, isolation is the way forward. And so when um, crops are not working, when they have breakdowns within their family, when they're isolated, mm -hmm. when they owe money, um, and when they've got the pressure of their um, so their, their generations, you know, they may have a farm in their family for 100 or 200 years or so. Mm. All of those pressures, farmers just give up after a period of time, they just can't see, and they have no concept of reality according to, you know, we live in London and we have that communication, but a lot of farmers live in isolated rural areas, mm. so they don't have no sense of socialisation the way that we do as well, which right. is a massive part of our mammals, we need to socialise. Right. But I mean, with the other ones, let's talk about stress, just for example. I mean, stress is something that we all deal with. Yeah. Um, you know, we, 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 a lot of us know a lot of nurses and, um, you know, physicians and people that work in the food service, sales managers, things like that, mm -hmm. um, that you've had on your list of both stress and depression. And, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's really quite scary to see that, actually, mm -hmm. that, you know, that these people are suffering from, especially the suicide one, because it's, it's one of those subjects that's not really spoken about, particularly mm -hmm. in, in the black community, it's a bit, it's a bit of a taboo, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, my, pre my previous guest, Marie, who I also mentioned in the book too, um, 
you know, he came near with it, he had suicidal thoughts. Um, and I wanted to ask you, being that it is men's mental health, you are a man, um, do you think that there's a greater um, sort of propensity for men to suffer from mental health? Is it just that they're not as open about it, so maybe they're suppressing their emotions? Yeah, I, I mean, a massive part of mental health is not sharing and uh, mm -hmm. expressing what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why, uh, and I'm really passionate about this, funny enough, Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons why men really suffer when it comes to expressing themselves mm -hmm. because we learn very quickly that when we express ourselves emotionally we turn into memes mm -hmm. and so when you look at for example when Tyrese started to you know when Tyrese had his breakdown mm -hmm. he, he's now a meme mm -hmm. forever and ever our men mm -hmm. he's now a meme mm -hmm. you know um, I remember and, and I talk about this quite a bit because once again I'm really passionate about this but if you remember there was a there was a young man about nine or ten years ago now who made a mistake. He, you know, outside of a club, he... And I don't know why I'm smiling. Yeah. See, that's yeah. really bad because it's because it was made into such a... I even know what you're talking yeah, about. exactly. And yeah. he said he made a mistake and now I'm like, okay. Yeah, he made a mistake and he performed an act mm -hmm. with his partner, um, yeah. you know, and uh, someone filmed it. Mm -hmm. And now every single year mm -hmm. they have a day for him mm. and so it's around new year's his picture comes up they laugh at him again yeah. he becomes he becomes the joke and all the rest of it what it's people don't know on the other yeah. side is that every single year he goes through that trauma over and over again every single year you know he probably got broken relationship because of it maybe his children doesn't respect him maybe mm -hmm. his family doesn't look at him the same way but every single year he's definitely gonna have some form of anxiety mm -hmm. because people the whole world of that community comes together mm -hmm. and the pictures get shared and, and it's, they, they actually call it said i'm not going to say his name because i don't mm -hmm. promote it anymore mm -hmm. but they call it said yada 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 wow and, and i didn't so, say that actually yeah and so it, and it's been going on every single year mm -hmm. for the last probably i don't know seven to ten years i can't remember what year it was mm -hmm. and the reason why i say this is because men Males, men learn very quickly not to express themselves emotionally in public because we, we learn that we end up becoming the butt of everyone's joke. Where if a woman tends to have a breakdown in public, people rally around and say, Don't worry, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But when men have breakdowns, we become memes, especially black men more mm -hmm. than any other. Have, um, we, have you heard from that said gentleman? Have you heard anything from him? I, I looked into some things, and once again, it was really sad. He was on the tube one day, and someone was like filming him, saying, You're that guy, you're that guy. And he was like, Just leave me alone, I can't take it no more, kind of thing. Yeah. So every time I've seen clips of him since that day, it was someone filming him, laughing at him, harassing him, and harassing him, etc. Mm -hmm. So this is how easy it is for, for us to make emotional decisions in public. And when I said it could be as, it could be. As drastic as what he done, mm -hmm. or as minor as Tyrese or other other men, especially mm -hmm. you know black men, uh, becoming emotional in public, and then he, he becomes a meme, mm -hmm. you know, it, and and so we learn very quickly as men not to share our emotions, mm -hmm. and that makes us suffer in silence. Right. So what can we do, especially as, you know the women in these men's lives and our, in our men's lives? What can we do to encourage support that opening up that that sharing because you said it's been the biggest problem is sharing yeah i mean th first and foremost is trust mm -hmm. we, we as men we we don't want um things thrown back in our face in the moment of an argument or disagreement yeah i've heard that and yeah. and that happens quite a lot to be honest mm -hmm. where you know women will turn around and say in moments to be to be hurtful and spiteful they will say things that hurt mm -hmm. and so it's first and foremost is to um, provide a, a space where men can express themselves without feeling like they're going to be um, there's going to be a revenge of of some type mm -hmm. down the line when there's a disagreement so trust is number one mm -hmm. um, number two is to give them the understanding that they are a human being because once again you know that the conversation of masculinity, which is a very prominent and a very good conversation, mm -hmm. but sometimes people misconstrue what masculinity actually means. Mm -hmm. And so in the, in the skies of masculinity, people, people, men once again hide their emotions because they feel mm -hmm. like they, um, they, are, they are not being masculine when they're expressing their emotions. Mm -hmm. And so it's having a good conversation of what is masculinity and, and what is, what is a, you know, a, 
natural human being thing to do, which is if you need to cry, you need to cry. If you need to express, you need to express. And teaching so, them from young. Yes, and teaching them that from Teaching them from when they're boys before they become men. Yeah, I believe in the household, you need to create a new culture. Mm. Don't try to change the culture outside if the culture on the inside is not. Is not um, mm. So when you get into a relationship or, you know, raising children, mm. you have to create a culture within the house mm. that allows everyone in the house to express themselves. Uh, where don't make don't make not the lack of expression yourself mm. be the reason of your mental and emotional traumas. Mm. Uh, make it be other things yeah. and then work on it. The but, issue with that though really say culture and I know culture's not just about, you know, I'm from Jamaica or whatever, it's the culture that you create the behaviours and the patterns, right? Sure. Um the issue with that is that obviously there's a lineage of your parents did it this way, so then maybe you picked up some habits and you've learnt some traits mm -hmm. that you then teach to your children, i.e. to be masculine means, you know, you, you, my mum used to say something like, where's your balls? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it took me to adulthood and I'm like, hang on a minute, but weird. Mm -hmm. I'm actually a girl, I'm a woman, I don't have, I don't actually have balls. So, you know, I know it's just a colloquialism expression, but it's quite a serious one in terms of, you know, man up. You know, it's that kind of man up, you know, and it was always used in the, in the, in, in the, in the sort of uh, situation where I was deemed as being emotional or too sensitive. And I, it, you know, it took me a little while till later on, it's like, yeah, well, well I am sensitive and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I can only ma imagine it for, uh, for a, a young boy, you know, um, and we briefly touched on this uh, last week as well. Growing up culturally in an area or society or community where you, you know that 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 idea of masculinity, femininity, or what's right for a man to express or what's right for a boy to express is kind of suppressed. You know, so that you can't actually even be human. Like to be human is to feel. But then we were taught from our parents, our our elders, whoever, women act like this, or girls act like this, and boys act like that? Well, that's a very good point, a very good question as well. I, I honestly believe that we need to, um, if we're going to progress mm -hmm. as from a cultural perspective, mm -hmm. we have to unlearn certain things. And I'll tell you the reason why I say that. I remember uh, about, probably about four or five years ago now, I i done some due diligence on the history of slavery, etc. Mm -hmm. And I realized when my parents used to beat me, mm 